Welcome to Mallory Park, venue for the latest event from the Classic Touring Car Racing Club. This festival of motorsport will feature saloon cars dating as far back as the 1950s, right the way through to modern classics from this century. No power steering, no ABS, no traction control. Just pure, gorgeous racing cars. This car is a 1972 Hillman Imp, which I've had for six years, and I convert it into a race car. The last five years I've been racing it. I do all the preparation myself, engines, suspension, the lot. It's super when it's working, right? But um, they can bite you, you know, like everything really. When it's on the limit, there's always a very fine line between doing it right and in the barriers, you know. It's a packed day with four groups of cars getting two races apiece and we begin with the Paul Lynch Classic Race Engines category for pre-1966 machinery. The mighty Ford Falcon of Alan Greenall on pole ahead of David Hall's Lotus Cortina, David Heal's Imp and Andy Messam's Mini 7. The left of your picture, the pole sitter, Alan Greenhall, fixes his eyes on the lights. Away we go then, on board with Michael Sheraton in the blue Ford Anglia. A good start for him from seventh on the grid. But who's going to get the run into turn one? It's going to be David Heal from third on the grid in the Hellman Super Imp that gets ahead of David Hall. They both get ahead of the pole sitter as the field charges into Gerrards for the first time. On board with Martin Reynolds in the Ford Anglia from ninth on the grid, chasing down Nick Strong. And off already with a problem, I'm afraid. Anthony Warns in the Wosley saloon. He pulls off the circuit. And look at this, the battle for second place is on already as the pole sitter, Alan Greenhall, somehow finds a gap wide enough to fit the Ford Falcon through. Into the SEC moves back ahead of David Hall. The minis of Neil Bray and Andy Messam ran fourth and fifth on board with sixth place. Michael Sheraton in the blue and white striped Ford Anglia trying to go around the outside here is Neil Bray. Oh, so wide in the number 76 mini. It didn't pay off. And he has to watch his rear guard now because Andy Messam was getting very close to him as we get a much better run with Michael Sheraton. Look at that, squeezing down the inside of the devil's elbow. And it looks like he might gain a place if he's got the straight line speed. And with the straight line speed, firing his way back into the lead already at the end of lap number one is Alan Greenhall, the grunt of that five-litre Ford Falcon, proving to be far too much for David Hill in the 998cc Hillman Super Imp. And there, coming up the inside to regain a position is the number five Andy Messam Mini. That's back ahead of the onboard camera of Michael Sheraton. So it is Greenhall in the lead. In the Imp, it's Hill in second place. Then it's the Lotus Cortina in third of David Hall. Coming back around the outside of the S's is Michael Sheraton, who just slings the car into the corner. But the Mini is much quicker on the exit and climbs the hill to regain the place. And here a big move up the inside with number 57, David Hall, fending off the fast approaching number 76 Mini of Neil Bray. That was trying to come around the outside of him. Back on board with Martin Reynolds just behind that top six battle as he makes his way out of the tight Shaw's hairpin. Downhill now, all the way through this rock. Roller coaster ride through the Devil's Elbow and trying to close the gap to the number 32 Nick Strong Ford Classic. And they're at it again for third place. Neil Bray in the mini going through at the inside of David Hall this time in the Lotus Cortina as Martin Reynolds switches from the outside to the inside. Down shifts, has a luck on the way to Gerrards to try and sneak up the inside of the number 32 Nick Strong car who is stranded on the outside line and Martin does get through. So this then becomes the battle for second place, the Hillman versus the Mini, and the race leader just starting to edge away now in the Ford Falcon, Alan Greenhall, many times a race winner for the Classic Touring Car Racing Club, a very experienced driver. His car will have an advantage in a straight line, but it will be difficult for him to get through this tight hairpin as Bray and Hall go wheel to wheel again. Out wide goes, Bray loses momentum. Andy Messam's number five mini comes alongside. Michael Sheraton again in the Ford Anglia gets the best run of all coming out of the Shaw's hairpin. But he, as he fights the wheel through the left hand, the mini of Messam just squeezes back ahead. And a close fight for 13th place as the number eight Paul Cooper driven Ford Cortina gets ahead of Luke Wilson in the number 69 Austin A40. And a whole gaggle of cars here in the midfield. The group led by Freddie Brown in the Hellman Imp. There is the black uh, Steve Dunn driven Austin A35 trying to get past the number 90 Morris Minor and Patrick Harris, number 12. He qualified in the top 10 and has slipped back in the mini is Nathan Scott Williams. And I'm afraid looking like he's headed for a time. And it's James Burrows in his Mini Cooper S. 
crowd has been treated to a frenetic first half of the race here. Now the top three are back together and David Hall in the Lotus Cortina goes for it down the inside into the Shaw's hairpin. Locks a wheel, gets the back end out on the exit of the corner, but he's going to get second place back away from David Hill here. As we go on board with Michael Sheraton lapping the beautiful Alfa Romeo of John Everard and then getting up the inside of Andy Massam in the number five mini. He almost handbrake turns it around the Shaw's hairpin as the back end of the Ford Anglia dances around, but he's now ahead of both of those those minis, Neil Breyer's dropped behind them. Coming back after them is Alex Williams in the red and white Ford Anglia as well, the number 39 car, after he made a slightly sluggish start to the race. So here are the top three. The Falcon just stretches its legs in a straight line, but they'll catch him up in the corners. And there for fourth place now, having started seventh in the race, is Michael Sheraton. Neil Bray is next to arrive in the number 76 Mini and going slowly in the background was number five, Andy Messam. So the other Mini looks like it's got a problem. Up then into sixth place has come the 39 Alex Williams driven Ford Anglia. There he is in the background catching these two as Neil Bray gets a really good run now. Coming out onto the back straight on the way into the S's. Who's going to be bravest on the brakes here? Are they going to bother braking? Just about, they slide the cars through and Bray gets his nose back in front in this fantastic battle for fourth place between the Mini and the Anglia. Make it Anglias because catching them all the time here as they fight is Alex Williams. It's going to be three-way battle here. Way out wide goes Bray. That means coming alongside him, but on the outside line for the Devil's Elbow is Sheraton. And sure enough, he has to back off out of the move as he dances the car through this flat out left hander and back onto the start finish straight there are the top three the gap staying about the same between them on that lap there's only three tenths of a second between these three in the qualifying session this morning they're coming up to traffic and there's a ball of smoke here and i'm afraid it's the hillman in, in trouble it was going well but number 48 freddie brown is definitely headed for retirement in this race as he pulls off the circuit Wherever you look at this race, there are battles to be had, and this is for 11th place. Patrick Harris in the Morris Minor has been caught by Luke Wilson in the Austin A40. Luke having passed and pulled away from Paul Cooper's Ford Cortina a couple of laps ago. Back on board with Michael Sheraton, who's lost ground to Neil Bray and now loses another position as we go to the closing stages. So the top Ford Anglia is now Alex Williams who comes through as we get the top three for the final time, heading towards the S's and going very defensive here, covering off his line. He's Alan Greenhall in the number 77 Ford Falcon just about closes the door in time the back end of the car this big heavy machine swings around and an uphill climb now to the final corner the final overtaking opportunity at least as David Hall almost runs into the back of the race leader breaking so late to try and fend off David Hill in that Hillman Supreme they somehow get it through the corner they spiral down into the devil's elbow for the final time the checkered flag awaits and it's Alan Greenhall who takes the win Here's the result with Greenhall, Hall and Heal all making the podium, while Bray, Williams and Sheraton complete the top six. Race two for the pre-66 cars coming up later in the show. Meanwhile, we move on to some more contemporary classics with a race that features three separate age groups, pre-93, pre-03 and pre-05. Despite falling into the older category, Ray West's BMW qualified comfortably on pole ahead of the fastest pre-03 car, the Honda Civic of Steve Barden. A packed grid of 30 touring cars prepare for blast off as the red lights go out here at Mallory Park. A terrific start for Steve Barden in the red and black Honda Civic, but going with him from fourth on the grid is Simon Ward in the Vauxhall Astra. He gets his nose in front, but then steaming back down the inside of him comes Barden to get the lead of the race. The pole sitter Ray West down to at least third place. There's the sub of Stephen Field being pushed out a little bit wide. A very good start at the inside for the Hyundai of Dan Fletcher. Number 275 kicking up the cement dust is Simon Ward as back through comes Ray West in the yellow and black BMW to regain second place. And there's been a not very good start for the blue BMW of number 90. Ian Bowers lost a couple of places from third on the grid. So the best BMW is now the green, red and blue machine of David Hunt from sixth on the grid. There he is, just behind the Astra. There is the one that started badly. He's dropped out of fifth place from third on the grid. Luke Allen just behind him in the Honda Civic as we go on board with Andrew Sheraton working away at the wheel of his BMW on the exit to the Shaw's hairpin right onto the tail of Ashley Parsons in the Clio as we're about to get a change of lead. Ray West with more horsepower down the inside to get the pole sitting BMW back through just before they get to Gerard's corner and the yellow flags which are waving there because a car off in the background 
It's on the Civic shaped, and it looked like it might have been the car of Lee Underwood from the fourth row of the grid. So Ray West back into the lead of the race. It was indeed the 183 machine of Lee Underwood. That must have been on the exit to the very first corner at the start of the race, and the safety car has been deployed. We're about to find out, I think, what happened on board with Andrew Sheraton in the midfield. And there are three cars up ahead going side by side, and two of them spear off onto the grass. One of them is the Civic of Lee Underwood, which went to the outside, and the other was Anna Barden in between them. I think it was the black Cleo of Neil Bray. So the race now gets back underway. The safety car peels in, the green flags are waved, and it's Ray West with a very good restart here. Steve Barden in second place. The fast-starting Simon Ward tucks in right behind it, the Vauxhall Astra in third. And there is a good start for Andrew Neal in the Peugeot 106 at the inside of the yellow Honda Civic of Trevor Keats. Just behind them, Gail Hill rounding out the top ten. Then you've got the first of the 05s. That's the blue Jason Brooks Cleo leading that category. And here comes the Uncle Luke's liveried Honda Civic, that very smart colour scheme driven this car by Luke Allen. He's in sixth place at the moment. He's trying to catch back up to the tail of Ian Boer's BMW and likewise David Hunt just ahead of them. They're still in second place, but leading the 03 category is Steve Barden in the Civic, just starting to edge away now from the Astra of Simon Ward, who's in the pre-93 class, third overall, but second in that category. Oh, and off here, a big, big one! That is the Alfa Romeo of Theodore Bridgman Williams that just went barreling into Shaw's corner. I wonder if he had some sort of failure because it just didn't slow down. He's taken the Saab with him of Stephen Field. And look, he's a long way back. He's not even trying to move here. Just don't think he can slow the car down. Stephen, unaware that there's a car spiralling up the inside, turned in and there was a big contact. But luckily, the driver is OK. His car, though, he's most definitely not at the Alfa Romeo. Look right up onto the tyre barriers there, right in front of our cameraman. And although he's got going again, I fear that Stephen Fields may be limping back to the pits in a pretty badly damaged Saab. A real shame that uh, Stephen really had nowhere to go in that incident. So the leaders onto the final lap of the race. There's David Hunt's BMW in fourth position, trying to catch an overall podium here. The top three Prio 5 Clio's come through. It's still Jason Brooks clear of Neil Bray in the black 276 car, but he's got. Close company with Anna Barden right with him as they make their way through Gerrards for the final time in the race. Coming up the hill, though, into the Shaw's hairpin and hitting the brakes hard for the final time is Ray West in a race which lost a lot of its laps through the safety car. It's been a bit of a sprint finish, this, and it's a very close finish for third place, but the Astra of Simon Ward should just be able to hang on. The chequered flag, though, and the first win of the day in the category goes to Ray West. Here's the top 10 with Ray West taking the overall and pre-93 class victory. Steve Barden in second, winning pre-03. And in 11th spot, Jason Brooks secures the pre-05 spoils. After the break, action from the pre-83 Group 1 touring cars, Classic Thunder and the Blue Oval Saloons. Welcome back to this festival of racing here at Mallory Park, organised by the Classic Touring Car Racing Club. Next up, it's the first race of the day for the pre-83 Group 1 Touring Cars. On pole, Stephen Primmett, one of the UK's most successful club racers. But Mark Osborne shares the front row and is every bit as quick. This promises to be an absolute cracker. The top five on the grid, all proven race winners as the lights go out. The race gets underway on board with Mark Osborne then from the front row of the grid. And he's got a better start here and a better start than everybody from fourth on the grid. It's the jag of David Howard. He gets the lead. Osborne into second. Gaines one, loses one. Third place then for Primit as the droop snoot of David Hall and the Rover P6 of Nick Strong go side by side for sixth place. Here then are the leaders and Stephen Primit look in the escort trying to come around the outside. Oh, but Mark Osborne, he's going to be brave stuff if he does this. Way, way, way around the outside, really deep into the corner. But even though he dances and skips his way through, he can't find a way past the Triumph Dolomite. Tremendous start though for David Howard from fourth on the grid to lead. Osborne in second, Primit in third place. There's Mark Cholleton in the Escort, the blue and white Escort in fourth place. And a good start as well for Peter Winston in the orange Escort just behind in fifth. Then the Droop Snoop got the better of the Rover. And then this is the battle for eighth place on board with Stuart Carr and the Ford Capri. The fast starting Datsun of Jonathan Corker just ahead. He's come from 13th on the grid in that glorious uh, livery. Beautiful car 
That's Datsun 510. There then is Peter Winston making a decent start to the race. And this is the view on board with the second place car of Mark Osborne, the Triumph Dolomite. And look at Mark dancing away there with a steering wheel. Just complete natural ability with these drivers of these cars with nothing in the way of drive raids. It's all about driver skill as Stephen Primit again gets alongside or halfway alongside. This time he tries the inside line on the way into the S's. There's no way through, so he now goes to the outside line, the back end of the Escort, dancing around. He's got his nose in front here. He gets on the power, he turns the car in, but he runs on the curves and the Dolomite gets back through. Charleston right with them in fourth place now as well. Two drivers giving it absolutely everything and giving it too much welly. Is Nick Strong as the back end of the Rover spins around and around on the exit to the Shores hairpin. Hopefully he'll get going again, though no damage to the car as the leaders exit Gerrards once more onto the step straight. And looking at that inside line with intent is Mark Osborne, but David Howe just about shuts the door in time. And around the outside again comes Stephen Privet on the attack on the way to the first part of the S's, but Osborne keeps his foot buried. He keeps calm and he gets the Dolomite back ahead. So second and third side by side again though as Primit darts around the outside of everybody here he's trying two for one David Howard runs him deep into the corner and now Osborne gets a better run than both of them coming out of the turn he could get the lead of the race here around the outside of the devil's elbow terrific move that great anticipation from Osborne but it was all triggered when Stephen Primit just tried a dan dare move he hasn't given up yet either he's again coming up the inside this time it works and finally he makes his way past David Howard. Let's have a replay of that. Fabulous driving here. So Primit just forgets to brake almost. Incredible stuff in the escort. Howard runs him deep and Mark Osborne says thank you very much indeed. Gets the better run out of the corner. Goes from third to first. There's the big yellow Camaro of Alan Wayman in eighth place. The red Capri of Mike Haynes, number 19, running just behind in ninth position. And then it's David Margales in the Alpha, rounding out the top 10. They're coming up to be lapped, though, by the hugely quick Triumph Dolomite of Mark Osborne. He hugely quick, but not as quick as Stephen Primitt, who is beginning to catch him up. And as the Alpha passes the Capri, the Dolomite is trying to lap both of them here. He gets in between them, but he's slightly delayed now by David Margales. So David Howard, having fallen away from the top two, is now busy looking in the mirrors, busy defending from the very quick Mark Cholleton, a uh, classic car racing champion. And Cholleton in the escort again gets a really good run here through the S's. The big heavy Jaguar can't cope with it. And the more nimble Ford Escort 2000 gets through. So that's for third place now. On board with Stuart Kai in the Capri now. And Stuart's got a good run here on David Hall in the Droop Snoop Forenza. He should have the position. He does. There's the rear facing camera. He's up to sixth place. And his next target, Peter Winston, is just ahead of him. Oh, the big impact there for Scott Rust in the Ford Escorts. That's at the S's. He's gone straight on. There's big damage to the front of the car. Popped the windshield out. Such was the impact when he hit the barriers. And happily, the driver is out of the car. Scott Rust is OK. That car, though, is going no further in this race. Back on track with Stuart Kai, and Stuart is right now with Winston and gets a better run coming out onto the straight. The S is coming up. The right-hand part is first, but we know Escorts are going to go and go around the outside. The Capri, though, does squeeze through. Trying to follow him is David Hall in the Vauxhall Forenza, and he might just do it on the climb uphill now. A right-hander coming up at Shaw's hairpin should favour the silver machine, and indeed, through comes the Vauxhall. So poor old Peter Winston loses two for the price of one. Meanwhile, there's late pressure here for the race leader as they go into the hairpin for the final time in the race. A big twitch for Mark Osborne. He can see Stephen Primitt right with him in the mirrors now. He daren't make a mistake. He daren't go offline. He should, though, just have enough in hand here. The Dolomite is quick in a straight line. Osborne goes through the devil's elbow and he wins the first pre-83 Group 1 touring car race of the day. So it's Osborne who takes the win and pole for race two by just eight tenths of a second after a thrilling battle with Stephen Primitt. Mark Cholleton, David Howard, Stuart Kai and David Hall complete the top six. The Classic Touring Car Racing Club is run by enthusiasts for enthusiasts, but such is the quality of the events that international tyre supplier MRF are lending their support this year. In the last couple of years, we've expanded and we're trying to, to build a name uh, within Europe and so, of course, you're going to build your name far better by being involved with really good marks. And I believe, you know, who doesn't like a classic touring car, you know? So I think that this is a, a great mark to be involved with. 
they spend so much time trying to build these cars in a way that's authentic and you know set up properly and with you know the proper suspension on it then why would you scrimp and put something like just a nothing wrong with normal road tires but if you're going to make a race car you need a race tire don't you Next, a combined grid for the highly modified cars in the classic Thunder Division and the Ford-based Blue Oval Saloon Series. Dale Gent and Dave Cockle both start from the front row. We get ready for the rolling start here. Dale Gent in the black Subaru to the left of your picture on pole position on board with Adrian Hawkins, who is passed here off the line by Andy Robertson in the Falcon for third place. So the Alpha down to fourth position. In the Boss Division, it's Pierce Grange and Paul Neville in their escorts ahead of number two, John Edwards' partner in the Fiesta. We saw him getting ahead of 57, Dan McKay. And then in fifth place, it was Scott Mathias in the orange escort as Adrian Hawkins now fires one at the inside of Dave Cockle and squeezes the Alpha through. And off goes the second place car into the gravel for Andy Robinson. And that V8 is going to be difficult to get out of the gravel trap here at Mallory Park. So disaster for him. He'll try and recover the car. There is the leader of the Blue Oval Saloons, Piers Grange, number 56. The Blue and Whites RS2000 to Paul Neville right behind him. So at the end of an eventful first lap of the race, it's Dale Gent that leads. Adrian Hawkins in the Alpha in second place. Dave Cockle next up in third. Promoted up to fourth place then with another Ford Falcon. Andy Wilson, the number 97 car. Then it's the Alpha of Lee Penn and Pierce Grange right behind. And Dave Cockle's got off the road from the top three. Normally a front runner and multiple race winner, but he's not going to get anything from this one. And John Edwards Parton, one of the front runners in the Fords, goes off wide as well. It's that oil down on the circuit because there are several cars slipping and sliding and going slowly as well. Tom Abbott suddenly crawling. And in the background, I think as well, another one that we've lost. There are a few of them. But I think one of them is the number 33 Paul Neville car that was running second in the boss class as the Sierra of Malcolm Wise there pings its way past Ben Dewan's BMW. Don't worry about the brollies, it's not raining, it's just hot here at Mallory Park. There's Richard Ascombe in the Jaguar with a gaggle of cars behind him. Coming up to lap people already is the race leader, Dale Gent, in the Subaru in Pretza, number 83. And he's about to come past one of the regular front runners in the Boss Series, the escort of Neil Argrave, number 53. And got to be careful here because they're all racing each other. Malcolm Wise in the number 14, Sierra, just firing one up the inside. Chris Baker's escort for position and so tentatively winding his way through these battles is the race leader. He's going to have a lot of lappery today. He's uh, several seconds a lap quicker than some of these cars and it's a short lap here at Mallory Park. He comes past Martin Reynolds, who's one of several drivers is racing different cars in different categories this weekend. So a busy day for him. He was at the Ford Anglia earlier on. Back on board then with the second place Alfa Romeo as he deals with traffic as well now. Third place for the Falcon of Andy Wilson, who's lapped this orange escort of Ralph Higson, but Ralph is staying with him at the moment, much quicker through the corners. At fourth place for Lee Penn, number seven, who's come from the third row of the grid. As the Battle of the Fiestas continues, they've both been lapped now. John Edwards Parton, number two, has got the inside line. He's got these lights ablaze in the older XR2 model. He carries great speed into the first part of the S's and gets back ahead of Dan McKay on board with the 323i of Ben Dewan. And for a couple of laps now, he has had his mirrors full of another Ford Fiesta. Demetrius Neofaitu keeping him very honest indeed. So two very different types of cars, very evenly matched around here and onto the grass, forced onto the grass is a man that's having a troubled race, Paul Neville. He's trying to find his way back through the field. He gets gripped suddenly as he gets back on the track. Tim Abbott almost <laughs> slides into him in the Capri. Uh, well up in the top 10, in fact in 7th place overall is the Clio, the only Clio in this race, George Young, has come from 11th on the grid, so he's doing a, a good job, back on board with Ben Dewan, who is passed by the Fiesta that's come flying through of Paul Finney, the white Fiesta. So that car now moves up into the top three in the boss division and he was in danger of losing a place to Neofoto as well. Uh, 33 trying to come back through the field again, but sliding again at Gerrard's again, I'm afraid, is Paul Neville, who kisses the barriers this time. And will he continue or is there sustained damage? Now I think he's going to pull off the circuit and call it a day. And having got ahead of the Fiestas of Edwards' partner, McKay, it's game over, I'm afraid, for Finney. The number 90 car grinds to a halt. No problems, though, for this driver. And another serene display from Dale Jett. He is going to take the chequered flag out of the devil's elbow for the final time. 
There's a lot of traffic ahead, but he won't have to worry about it because he wins the race here at Mallory. A convincing win then for Dale Gent, but Adrian Hawkins is the top Class B car in second place, while Lee Penn completes the top three. Victory in the Burton Power Boss Division, though, goes to Pierce Grange in fifth place. I'm having to pump the clutch pedal every time I want to change down, so um, I've got to break that a little bit earlier to allow time to do that. So um, we're not as quick as we could be, really, but um, evidently quick enough. Join us after the break for our second 366 race of the day. And we find out how many Clios in a row fit through the hairpin. Welcome back to our festival of classic touring car racing from Mallory Park with the pre-66 cars about to get their second race underway. The grid is based on the race one result, but sadly we're missing the pulsating falcon of Alan Greenhall. So it's the Lotus Cortina of David Hall that leads them off the line as the lights go out. It's another good start for Michael Sheraton as he resumes his battle with the mini of Neil Bray and up ahead it's side by side for the lead of the race, look, and it's David Hill in the imp that gets there first. Second place for Hall, I reckon third is going to be Sheraton, Bray in fourth place, and here's the number eight, Paul Cooper, Ford Cortina trying to get up the inside of 32, Nick Strong as the rest of the pack make their way through Gerrards for the first time in the race. The top four then, as I called it, in fifth place, you've got the number 39, Alex Williams, Ford Anglia, the red and white machine, Sixth place, the Anglia of Martin Reynolds. He's been chased by the black Austin 835 of Steve Dunn, number 44. They make their way through the S's for the first time in the race. The rest of the field squeeze through, no dramas. They climb uphill. There's Neil Brain, fourth place on the brakes, trying not to go into the back of the Ford Anglia of Michael Sheraton, with whom he and we enjoyed a huge battle in the first race. He also had the number five mini of Andy Messam involved in that until his car let go midway through the race. But he's back in this one, and he might be able to come through from the back of the field in a slightly depleted grid of cars. So at the end of the first lap of the race, it's David Hill that leads in the imp. That car had a big accident at the end of last year, was rebuilt over the winter, and this is its first time out this season here at Mallory Park as Michael Sheraton gets about as close as he dares to David Hall. The Anglia of Martin Reynolds in sixth place, and there's the aforementioned Andy Messon from the back of the field, already up to seventh in the Mini and looking pretty menacing as well. Another battle going on is between the Mini of Neil Bray, which has fallen back into the clutches of Alex Williams. So it's Mini versus Anglia in two separate battles here, one on the defence, one on the attack. Very much on the attack is Andy Messer, who slides it at the inside now, through the right, into the left, he goes around the outside. Tremendous move there through the S's. Look at these two, they've been joined at the hip all day long. Patrick Harris in the Morris Minor versus Luke Wilson in the Austin A40. This for 10th spot in the second race of the day for the pre-66s. They're both trying to catch up to Steve Dunn in the Austin A35. He's about a second up the road as they head into the Shores hairpin. And then just behind them in this pristine Ford Cortina Mark 1 GT is Paul Cooper. And look at him working away at the wheel inside the cockpit as he negotiates the tightest corner on this short lap here at Mallory Park. Up through the gears and heading then towards the Devil's Elbow. Right, the leaders are together, just lapping the alpha of John Everard. And for the time being, at least, David Hall has pulled away from Michael Sheraton and he's free to attack the race leader. And Sheraton is under attack himself. A change for third place. Guess who it is coming through? That's right, Neil Bray. Those two have been battling all day long. Out on his own now inside the top six, though, is Martin Reynolds. And look at him hacksawing at the wheel here to try and correct the car as he goes flat out through Gerrard's. Oh, it's a miserable day, I'm afraid, for Anthony Warns. The Wosley out for second race in succession. The leaders now make their way through the traffic and out wide on the exit to Gerrard's corner. Onto the grass goes David Hall. A huge bounce then as he hits a rat on the grass and loses a huge amount of time. That would have been uh, pretty painful inside as well, with not too much suspension on the car. He's still in second place, but he's lost an awful lot of ground as he uh, laps this pristine Michael Loveland helmet in, the number 22 blue and white car. Uh, so, a bumpy ride there, but he survives, and now it's game on for third place. Might be game on for second, because, of course, these two have closed the gap again to David Hall. So, Bray and the Mini just ahead in third. That Mini is becoming very wide at times on the way into the hairpin. He locks a wheel, smokes the tyre, gets out of the corner slightly quicker than the Mini, almost gets alongside him again, but as they go up through the gears, the Mini just pulls clear and gets his nose back in front through the devil's elbow. Uh, there is Paul Cooper making his way very literally out of the same corner. He swings this way, he swings that, he goes on the grass, he just about gathers it back up before he goes into the barriers. That was a leery moment. Let's have a look what it looked like on board. 
on the exit, the power goes down, he wrestles this way, wrestles that, he has the presence of mind to downshift, pulls calmly away from the barriers, back on track, good as a cucumber. There it is then, the chequered flag falls, and it's David Hill that wins. David Hall takes second in the Lotus Cortina, and after a phenomenal day-long battle, Neil Bray and Michael Sheraton finish third and fourth, ahead of Alex Williams and Andy Messam. Two of the drivers to feature in our next race for pre-93, 03 and 05 touring cars are husband and wife, Steve and Anna Barden. It is good going away as a family um, and doing racing um, together. Um, it's, it's one of those things that we enjoy together, even going to watch motorsport together. So um, I have a lot of trust in, in Steve and in having this up a car as well, um, which has been amazing. Um, so it's the first time I've brought out this car this season um, and Steve set it up from scratch and it's proved well. Both cars are set up exactly the same. We run the same pressures, same setups. So whether it works for both cars is, is one thing, <laughs> but yeah, they're both set up exactly the same and we give each other feedback, so it does help a little bit. The cars are on the grid, ready for the second pre-93, pre-03 and pre-05 touring car race of the day. Ray West on pole position is off like a shotgun. That looks like a jump start by a million miles, but he's gone and now he's got the lead of the race by a couple of seconds by the time the rest of them get into the first corner at Gerrard. Steve Barden, a hint of a jump start potentially for him as well. He might have been set off by Ray West. As the green Honda Civic of James Alford and the maroon Clio of Ashley Parsons go wheel to wheel. Watching it from just behind is the BMW of Andrew Sheraton. They come out of Gerrard's for the first time. Then a look at the two Clios here. The black Clio of Neil Bray about to move ahead of Jason Brooks for the class lead. And then the BMW of Dean Cranham comes storming through from 15th on the grid. There then is Ray West, the leader by a long, long way, probably more than he should be, on the way to Shaw's hairpin. And there is another BMW, Ian Boa, trying to gain a position here on David Hunt, who he lost out to in the first race. He looked a bit sluggish coming out of the hairpin as well. Ray West then is going to pick up a 10 second jump start penalty. He's already two and a half seconds clear, mind you, at the end of the first lap of the race, and a penalty as well for Steve Barden. We're going to get a replay now from Steve's car. Look to the right for the pole sitter. The lights haven't gone off yet. Ray goes. And yeah, he, he does trigger Steve off there. It was just a reaction, really, to the pole sitter rather than anything deliberate. Here it is again. And there, Ray West going well clear. Bottom was only just slightly ahead of the lights, but the sensors will have picked that up. And it's a penalty for both of them. So Simon Ward here in the Vauxhall Astra in third place could potentially win this race. He's third on the track, but he's leading the race with the corrected time. And here's a good battle going on. Another BMW involved. That's the 777 car of Graham Myers coming under heavy fire from Trevor Keats and the yellow Honda Civic Type R. These two running well inside the top 10 as we go back on board with Andrew Sheraton, who is getting embroiled in this pre-05 battle. He's in a pre-1993 BMW, so he's in a different class to the Clio's ahead, who are all squabbling away. Look, there's four of them together here on the way to the Shaw's hairpin. Then there's contact at the inside. It goes Ashley Parsons. There's contact with Jason Brooks. And there's more contact. And around goes the 27 two car of Ashley Parsons uh, there's also dramas for Ross Craig normally a front running driver in that car but he's had trouble with it all day I'm afraid so that one is cruising back to the pits and it's Neil Bray in the black 276 Clio who comes out on top Brooks the winner of the first race in the category has come out second and there third as she was in the earlier race is Anna Bardem here's a replay from Sheraton's car then Anna goes to the outside line there's a tight squeeze there's contact between Brooks in the blue car and then Parsons in the maroon car there's more contact on the way out of the corner and it's Parsons who is sent into a spin he won't be best pleased with that a beautiful sunny day here at Mallory Park and temperatures rising on the track as Trevor Keats takes a grassy excursion on the exit to the S's. Gail Hill in the Jag is now going to come up the inside and possibly as well James Alford in the green Honda Civic. There is Gail, a uh, very successful and experienced driver. She finished in the top 10 in the earlier race. Uh, Andrew Sheraton then has been seeing it all go on from the BMW. He's very good on the brakes and closes right up to the Clios through the Shores having once again. And this is the squabble for the lead of the category. Meanwhile, here is a replay of an understeering Dan Fletcher in the Hyundai Coupe that's going through Gerrard. He was just behind Steve Barber in the 214 Clio, who runs in the top six in the pre 05 division. And up ahead, that's the battle for the class lead. And the blue Clio of Jason Brooks gets at the inside of Neil Bray. There's a tiny bit of contact on the way through. 
but he's made it as we go into the closing stages of the race. Steve Barden in the Honda second on the road, but he's only fifth on corrected times once his 10 second penalty is applied and well out of shape here for Ian Boa, goes straight on, boom, into the tyre barrier on the exit to Shaw's hairpin. The BMW buried deep and he just couldn't slow the car down in time. Uh, that's why he ran a bit wide and as he braked, he got the wheels on the grass and then from there on, I'm afraid he was a passenger, he actually accelerated rather than slowed towards the barriers, which did their job effectively. But Boa out of the car and OK, thanks to the help of the marshals, he'll be taken to safety. And look, we're missing a Clio. The blue Jason Brooks car has gone AWOL. A replay, I think we're going to find out why now. Oh, there was more contact between Bray and Jason Brooks. That is too much love loss between those two today. Uh, so there was the contact. Bray got his nose back in front and then Brooks slowed. So whether it was damage or a problem with the car, but he looks like he's headed for retirement after winning the earlier race. Within his class, leading this race overall is that number 10 BMW of Ray West. He picked up that 10 second penalty for a jump start, but he's got his head down, he's got on with it, and he's pulled far enough clear that even with the penalty, he's going to win the race. But what about second? There is the Honda, the red and black machine of Steve Barden. He crosses the line, but is he more than 10 seconds clear of Simon Ward in the Astra? It's going to be really, really close here. Ward can sense the opportunity. He guns it through the traffic. He crosses the line and by 0.6 of a second, he's done it. Simon Ward finishes second. Confirmation of the top three with West and Barden both winning their respective classes. David Hunt, Luke Allen and Graham Myers completing the top six and Neil Bray in 11th as the Prio 5 class winner. The first race, I didn't get a very good start. I bogged down and we didn't really go. Um, so I was determined in the second race to get it right, but I got it a little bit too right. Um, I was looking at the lights and all of a sudden my foot slipped off the clutch and I thought, that's it, I've got to go. Um, I could see that I was going to get a 10 second penalty. Um, so I thought the only way I can do deal with it is just by charge through everything and charge through the traffic through the whole race, just so I could clear the 10 second penalty. Um, and luckily for me, it worked. The final two races of the day coming up after the break with action from the classic Thunder Saloons and the pre-83 touring cars. Welcome to the final part of our coverage. Next, it's race two for the mighty classic Thunder Saloons, which will feature Richard Ascombe's Jaguar XJR. I've had it for about seven, eight years. Um... It's a supercharged four-liter, just pushing over just for uh, 300 at the rear wheel. Plenty of torque with the, with the uh, supercharger on it. Big brakes, being a Jaguar, it's a big car. You can take some stopping. Uh, and the slicks help it go around the corners a bit. Collectively, a serious amount of horsepower is about to rumble its way onto the Mallory Park circuit as race two for the classic Thunder Saloons and Burton Power Blue Ovals gets underway. Dal Gent from pole position is going to sneak through ahead of A.D. Hawkins. Then in third place, it's going to be Andy Robinson in the Falcon. Pierce Grange, their number 56 in the Escort, is leading the boss category and he's being chased at the moment by Neil Argrave. At the fiesta of John Edwards Parton going well once again. He got a good start in race one. Here are the top three, though, absolutely together. Three very different types of cars, huge amounts of power between them, the Subaru, the Alpha, and then the Ford Falcon, first, second and third, flying up the hill. You're on board with the second-place car of A.D. Hawkins, down through the gears, onto the brakes. There are no gaps, there's no way through for Hawkins, but he's keeping up with the all-wheel drive Subaru and his front-wheel drive Alpha as they accelerate once more into the Devil's Elbow. Right with them still is Andy Robinson, and here come all the Fords squeezed up together. There's the Capri of Tim Abbott trying to find a way past the ultra-experienced Malcolm Wise in his Sierra as the top three begin to pull away from the rest of the field now. And remember, in second place, that Alpha is a Class B car, keeping up with the Class A Uber powerful Dale Gent car. So well prepared that Dale Gent car, and Dale is a fabulous driver himself. Uh, being passed there was the BMW or Ben Dew and the green 32i. It looks like he's got a problem, I'm afraid. They all came streaming past him. That's uh, got Matthias there, number 86. He's about to launch an attack on Tim Abbott and maybe also on Malcolm Wise. He does, he gets past both of them before they get to the braking zone for the S's. His next target is the Fiesta, and a massive lock-up here for the Clio of George Young. That will not do the tyres much good, but George gets around the corner, loses time, 
and still smoke pouring from the tyres in the cockpit. That won't smell too good. Richard Askham going in the Jaguar. He didn't get too far in the first race, but about to concede a position here to one of the very quick escorts out there, Pierce Grange, number 56, leader of the Boss category, winner of that category earlier on. A replay of that lock up there, just dragging the front tyres, screaming in agony and protest over the tarmac, was young, but he made the corner. Things have spread out a bit now for the top three. Still in second place is A.D. Hawkins, putting a lap on the Sierra as he goes around the outside of it through Gerrards. They've lost touch with Dale Jen. Not too far back in the mirrors is Andy Robinson in the double zero Ford Falcon, the five-litre beast. And great move that from Abbott around the outside of Malcolm Wise there in the Capri, back and dancing around but he gets it under control. At fourth place overall for the Class C leading number seven Lee Penn Alfa Romeo 33. That's one of the Thunder Saloon cars, uh, which are dominating, as you'd expect, the front end of the field. And the top five rounded out by the other Falcon, number 97, Andy Wilson. So he accelerates out of the shawls hairpin. Richard Askham's Jaguar coming under fire from either side here. It's going to be another good, tidy move, this, from Scott Mathias in the orange escort. Trying to follow him through his Neil Argrave. He can't quite do it, as Richard is very good on the brakes. Into the final corner for the final time. Then he's dealt with the traffic. He's dealt with everything thrown at him. And after a difficult qualifying session, he's dominated both races here. Dale Gent accelerates out over the line, lights ablaze, and takes the chequered flag here at Mallory Park. A double victory for Dale Gent with Adrian Hawkins once again as his closest rival. The Falcons of Robinson and Wilson, Lee Penn, and boss winner Pierce Grange complete the top six. A little bit, I had to turn, turn her down a little bit. I don't know, I, we, we thought we'd try her in the top power coming off, but as we come off the hairpin, I don't know if it's the hump there where she was just picking the back end up, I was lifting the car up, and it felt like I was having a spoof spike. It was almost like a hitting the limit, and I was, you know, like the brakes were coming on. But um, I figured that out in the end, and uh, yeah, it was going all right. Who's going to take the spoils in the final race of the day? It's the pre-83 Group 1 Touring Cars. Race 1 winner, Mark Osborne, on pole position in the Black Triumph Dolomite Sprint as the lights go out. It's a good start for the pole sitter. It's a better start than in the previous race for Primit. And it's another gun start here for the Jaguar of David Howard. Mark Chollerton coming through as well with a very good start to the race. And it's going to be Mark Osborne that leads side by side here between Nick Strong in the Rover and Peter Winston in the Orange Ford Escort. It is indeed the Dolomite in first place, David Howard though charging up through the order again from fourth to second this time, we're from fourth to first in race one, and that means that Stephen Primitz, like in race one, drops down to third place. Uh, only last time he started the race from pole position, he'll be absolutely itching to get past the Jaguar because he can see his key rival here, the Dolomite of Mark Osborne, already making his escape, and sure enough, he goes for it. Very first chance he gets on the way out of the hairpin, but that Jaguar has got plenty of grunt and he'll just drive back alongside him as they come out through the devil's elbow. So first at the end of the opening lap of the race, it's Osborne. It's just about Howard at the moment with his nose in front for second, but very, very good on the brakes is Stephen Primit. He never, ever gives up. And through he comes on the way into Gerrard. That forces the Jaguar out wide and Mark Cholleton now has a nibble at him as he comes out of the corner but can't quite find a way through. Back on board with Stuart Kai. He had a good battle with the man ahead of him in the first race. The Vauxhall Forenza droop snoot of David Hall, though, is going to have to concede. He yields the position. And we look back from the Capri now as it comes through on the way into the S's. A puff of smoke as Mark Charlton locks up the front right here of his escort and having got his nose in front of the Jaguar of David Howard now, that means he's up to third place. So it is from pole position. The Dolomites of Mark Osborne in the lead of the race. Stephen Primitt in second place trying to catch him. Cholleton up to third. Fourth place for Howard in the Jaguar. A very good start for Alan Wayman in the yellow Camaro. He's gone from eighth to fifth. Stuart Kai in sixth place. And up to seventh there with a very good move is Stephen Cripps in the black, red and white. Number 40 escort. So he gets up the inside of Hall in the Forenza and the Forenza was smoking wasn't it as it went through Gerrards. Here's the view on board with Stuart Kai then who is starting to home in on the big very powerful Camaro driven by Alan Wayman. Just that 5.7 litre engine to try and wrestle his way past. A big wide car as well but the Capri is no slouch either and Stuart Kai a very quick uh, man behind the wheel of the car. He's got to watch the mirrors at the same time as he attacks, though, because Cripps is absolutely flying here. 
He's come from the back of the field. He's about to squeeze through up the inside into the devil's elbow. And he gains a place, the back end of the car hops and skips and dances around. But somehow he just about gets the tyres planted. So his next target is now Alan Wayman, and he hesitates not. He goes down the inside straight away on the way into Gerrard's corner. And after missing race one with technical problems and having to come from the back of the grid, it's back to business as usual for Cripps. And flying as well is Stephen Primit. Look, he's already caught up to the Dolomites as they come through the hairpin. The back end steps out on Mark Osborne's black machine. He corrects it on the steering here, but sliding, he's not going forwards and it's scrubbing speed off all the time. Here's the three-way battle for fifth place as Stuart Kai tries to squeeze the Capri up the inside here. But the number 40 Escort will have the better line for the Devil's Elbow and he holds on for sixth place, but they allow uh, Alan Wayman to escape. Well, as ever, the pre-83 touring cars have been tremendous fun today. And here, coming up to lap the Rover, is the race leader, Mark Osborne, but he's getting held up here through Gerard's corner. And Stephen Primitt just guns it around the outside of both of them here. It's still going to be tight, though, when they get to the S's. The Dolomite will have the inside line. He's coming back at Stephen Primitt, but we know how good Stephen is in that escort, under braking. And we've got a change of lead. So Osborne there. Delayed by the back marker as they went through Gerard's corner. Primit read the situation beautifully. Osborne will be frustrated, but he's got time to retaliate here. That's exactly what Stuart Kai is doing at the moment in this battle for sixth place. The blue and white Capri is alongside, but not fully. Goes on the curves. Left-hander coming up, though, and he's going to be on the outside line. He has to stay out wide, and coming at them both is David Hall in the Vauxhall Forenza. Still side by side here. Who's going to be the last of the late breakers? Oh, so tight there. Cripps and uh, Kai almost make contact. Kai's delayed. He's not happy about that. He had to get off the throttle and he loses a place to haul in the Forenza. There's David Margales in the GTV6, a lap down, 11th place, and being caught by Mike Haynes in the Ford Capri. Uh, now, look, Cripps is going slowly in the black escort. He's been passed by David Hall. He's been passed by Stuart Kai and he lost speed coming out of the Devil's Elbow, so he's fallen to the back of this four-way group, this four-way battle that we've now got for fifth place. As we go back to Mark Osborne in second place, but he is losing ground now to Stephen Primit into these closing stages, and he's a long way back. So Primit has just got to negotiate the hairpin one final time. He's not as flamboyant as normal, he's just bringing that car home. Stuart Kai, meanwhile, is back under the tail of David Hall and the Camaro of Alan Wayman as they go on to their last lap of the race. Stuart's got a better run here, going into Gerrard's brave move, that underbreaking. He gets through, he gains a place as the chequered flag comes out for Stephen Primit. So the final race of the day ends with victory for Stephen Primitt. A disappointed Mark Osborne has to settle for second, and Mark Chollison joins them on the podium, with Howard Wayman and Kai completing the top six. Usual poor start, and Dave Howard <laughs> got in front of me again, and but this time between me and Mark, so that made it desperate to get past him, to be honest. So I could get after Mark, eventually made it stick, and then it's just a matter of putting qualifying laps in, really, and trying to reel him in, reel him in. Mark was bought heavily by the Rover and, and I just went, took my chance on the outside, hoped I, I could hang on on the outside and, and she stuck and, and that was it. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we did. A great showcase for classic touring car racing. Bye for now.